All right, so there's a lot to cover today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 16. So you ready? We're going to dive right in. Some of you are like, what the heck? Is hey, welcome. So Acts chapter 16 is where we are. Last week, we talked about how Paul uh, arrived at Philippi and how he basically was starting the church in the, in the city of Philippi, how he met Lydia uh, on the beach side, and just kind of an unusual way to do things, and how Paul the only way that the church could get started in a city like Philippi is for Paul to recognize that it wasn't about him, but it was about Jesus, about moving to, to obedience and being obedient to what Jesus has called him to instead of uh, just doing his own plan and following his own ways. So that's where he started, and so now we're just going to continue on that story. Acts chapter 16 is where we are. Verse, uh, we'll start in verse 16. 16, 16, it makes it easy, right? Some of you, are, yeah, okay, good. Verse 16. And uh, we'll just kind of dig in here and see what's going on, all right? Uh, as we were going to the place of prayer, this is where the, the, the ladies were meeting. They said that we were going to this place one day. We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. That's not so bad. But Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. All right, so this is kind of crazy. You start off this story. They're going to the place of prayer, basically going to go on their way to church. And this slave girl starts following him. She has a spirit of divination. You know what that is? She can see the future kind of thing. The Spirit has enabled her to see the future. It's a, de a demonic influence here. And she could tell people secrets about their lives. This is told the, the, um, the fortune teller, you know, the reading the card kind of thing going on here. And she's able to do this. She's made her owners lots and lots of money. The, the, the fortune tellers of this day and age were widely used. People uh, respected them. They needed them. Uh, they abused them and, and used them. They're usually slaves. And they uh, would not even go to war without consulting someone like this, a little girl who'd been possessed who could tell the future. Uh, and so they, this person, was, this little girl, was bringing lots of money to her owners. She was a, a valuable commodity. And, uh, she, but fortune telling was forbidden in the Old Testament. It's something that was not supposed to happen. We weren't supposed to look to the future in that way. We're supposed to trust God. Now, here we get this girl who's telling the truth about these guys. Hey guys, listen up. I'm a fortune teller, I know. These guys are talking about the most high God and this is the way to salvation. And everyone would listen to her and because of the kind of position she had, they would have listened and, and understood and trusted her to be telling the truth to them. All right? That was her job is to tell the truth about the future, tell the truth about secrets in people's lives. So why is it that Paul gets so annoyed here? Why does Paul stop this? Well, let me tell you. Because in Philippi, and in this culture, in this day and age, the most high God was a designation for pretty much any God that you thought was the coolest. So if you said most high God, you could be talking about Zeus, you could be talking about Ares, you could be talking about anybody, and it would be, oh, cool, yeah, that one, yeah. Okay, cool, so they're on the team with all those other people that we've heard about, right? And it, so they would trust her. Yes, they must be. So they must be telling the truth. The way to salvation is through the most high God, whoever these guys are. And so her testimony, what she is saying is that the God that Paul proclaims is on the, on the level, is, is equal to the other gods in the pantheon of the people of this time. This God that Paul proclaims is nothing more than a Zeus or nothing more than anything else. Does that make sense? So she's not telling the truth completely. Make sense? She's not telling the full truth. It's not everything going on here. She's confusing the issue. Man, anybody could have been a God at this time. And so Paul's like, man, this has got to stop. She's, it's not that she's proclaiming truth. She's proclaiming a half-truth and causing our testimony to be corrupted. The thing that we're trying to proclaim, the truth about Jesus, is being, is being corrupted because of what she says. So we don't want her to say this anymore. The truth coming through a wrong source or delivered inappropriately, it loses its effectiveness. Now here's the point for us. First things first, let's just get this out of the way. As Christians, as people that say we follow Jesus, we need to speak truth. 
but sometimes truth gets confusing because we don't speak a full truth or we don't hear a full truth. The simple gospel message, the simple truth that that believers are supposed to to proclaim and supposed to understand is that Jesus has, has lived, Jesus has died, and Jesus will come again. I don't know any other way to make it simpler than that. That's the basics right there, all right? Christ has come, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, right? That's what it's all about. And last week, we, remind, we were reminded over and over again that our life, our identity, our, our religion, whatever, it's not about us, it's about... Okay, good, just making sure you remembered. Okay, that's good, that makes me feel happy, all right? It's about Jesus, and we need to remember this. We need to keep reminding of ourselves of this. Every morning we preach this truth to us, that it's not about us, it's about Jesus. You wake up and you say, man, it's not about me today. Today it's about Jesus. And sometimes we forget. I get that. I understand that. That's why we have community. That's why we have friendships. That's why we continue to seek God, why we read our Bibles. All of the religious activities that you may have heard of are there to remind us that it's not about us. It's about Jesus. Okay, good, got that, sweet. Now, whenever we're dealing with people, we gotta remember that, that, that uh, it, there's gonna be conflict and that people are not gonna understand everything that we say. There's gonna be times when even though we speak truth, people don't understand or people get offended or people just are, are upset at us for some reason. It's going to happen. But mature disciples, people who are seeking to be mature people, right, that are going to continue to put Jesus in each and every situation. We come to a conflict and we say, man, this is not good. I thought I was clear here and there's obviously some tension between me and and -and so-and-so. And we get these these, uh, situations and we gotta say, man, I, I I don't understand. How is it that we can continue to put Jesus back in those situations? We have to be very clear in everything that we do as a disciple. If we're going to be mature followers of Christ, we have to be clear and speak truth and speak truth that makes sense to everyone. For Paul, he wanted this girl to speak a clear truth, right? What she was saying was not completely true. And so Paul spoke a clear truth to her. Demon, get out, right? That is, that is destructive, that's distracting, that is disunifying, that's not what we're about. Only Jesus is the most high God. You speak on behalf of all gods, quiet, no more. So Paul spoke very clearly to that situation. Clarity is revealed when we do this, guys. So we have to learn to do a couple of things. And just real quick, so you know, we need to learn to speak truth. First off, speak truth with love. And I say that as opposed to being quiet. I think a lot of our culture has gotten in trouble because Christians have refused to speak truth. They have just said, well, let's just be quiet and maybe it'll go away. And a lot of times we do this, right? You get in conflict with somebody and you're just like, oh, he's mad at me. And you just smile and nod and just hope that maybe the situation will go away. And you don't speak the truth that you're feeling, right? Do that. Anybody, I, okay, I do that. <laughs> I don't know that. If you don't, that's fine. It's easier a lot of times to say nothing than to speak the truth. Controversy, in, in most of us, controversy is to be avoided at all costs. If we are going to be truth tellers, be mature, we must learn to speak the truth. That means say it, all right? Then we also have to speak the truth with our ears. Your mama ever tell you you need to speak more with your ears? Right? What do you mean by that? You need to listen. (laughs) Listen. Listen to the situation. How else are you going to know exactly what's being said? Have you ever answered a question and that's not the question they were asking? All right, I was at the doctor a couple weeks ago, just a regular old checkup, no big deal. The lady, the nurse was going down the list of questions. Do you, you know, have you ever smoked? Do you do all this kind of stuff? And she gets to the question and says, how often do you drink? And I said, I drink every time I get thirsty. And she looked at me what? I said, every time I'm thirsty, I drink. She's like, alcohol? I said, no, no, I don't drink alcohol that often. I I just drink when I'm thirsty. She's like, oh, that's not what I was asking. I need to know about the alcohol. Oh, okay, got it, right? So she asked a question. It's a clear question. I gave a clear answer, but we were not communicating, right? That happens so often in life. We're just not quite catching what is being said. 
It's very important for us, if we want to be truth speakers, to be very clear in our understanding of what is being asked. What is the culture saying about all of these things? There's so many issues that we could dive into, and I, we just don't have time for that. But listen carefully to what the culture says. And what is the question that's being said by your friends and your, and your relatives and your loved ones? Sometimes the, the, the surface question is not really what they're asking. You ever had that happen before? They say, man, I get so upset about this political figure. And you start digging. It's not about a pl- politics. It's a hard issue a lot of times. They got some issues they're trying to figure out on the inside. And they're just taking it out on that political guy this time, right? Because those guys are easy targets, let me tell you, right? Public figures are. Speak the truth with our ears, even though we, we have to listen first. Then speak the truth with our lives. We have to live lives of integrity. When we say we're going to do something, follow through. Be a truth liver as well as a truth speaker. And then speak the truth with honesty. I mean, this is the biggest thing for me. Admit your mistakes. <laughs> You're like, I don't know. Mistakes? What are you talking about? Admit your mistakes. We mess up. All of us do. Well, I do a lot, right? I mess up. And I have to learn to say, hey, look, I was wrong there. This is really hard, but it's a great lesson, especially for parents, right? Parents get in there and they mess up and their kids know it. (laughs) And the kids are like, you said or you told me. And I'm like, I was wrong. That's the hardest thing you can do is say that to your kids. I was wrong. I'm sorry. But if we can learn to admit truth in each situation, especially to our kids, Do you understand how that changes them, how that molds them, how that influences the next generation? We have to learn to speak this truth. We have to be a a truth speaker so that we can continue to grow, continue to be mature. So after he speaks truth to this girl, here's what happens next. Uh, Verse 19, but her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Not fun. Just so you know, stocks are not cool. This is not a fun kind of thing. This isn't like a nice padded prison cell. Stocks are uncomfortable, twisting your body in all kinds of ways to make you more uncomfortable so that you will not try to escape. So he puts them in this kind of, this place. Then they were so ticked off about losing money because of this girl losing her abilities more concerned about profit than they were about the life of a little girl, that they throwed Paul and Silas into prison. They beat them, have them beat with rods. They, these magistrates, they had the authority to do pretty much anything at, at this time, but this was a miscarriage of justice because we find out later that Paul and Silas are both Roman citizens and you can't arrest or imprison a Roman citizen without a trial. You definitely can't beat them without a trial. So we find out later that this was just a bad thing. But sometimes telling the truth speaking truth like Paul did to this little girl and into this city at this time, it does not set you free. You know the truth, you know the truth, the truth. Sometimes it will set you free internally, set you free spiritually, but sometimes it causes even more conflict to speak truth. I'm sorry, that's not fun. And nobody likes to hear those kinds of things. But sometimes speaking the truth will not resolve conflict. Sometimes there will still be controversy. Sometimes that happily ever after is not going to happen when we speak truth. In our world, we are sinners and we are dealing with other sinners. And broken people do broken things all the time. And we have to understand that even as a mature Christian, we have to understand that people are broken, that people do these things. And people sometimes don't respond as we would hope that they would or that we would expect someone who follows Jesus would because people are broken. We are sinners. We each respond on our own needs a lot of times. It's our, our instinct. But does that change what is expected of us? No. We still have to strive to speak the truth. 
still have to tr strive to be truth sayers no matter what's going on, no matter what might happen to us. God is big enough to do anything. He can change any situation. It doesn't matter how broken your relationship is right now, God can change it. We have to be continually speaking truth, continually proclaiming that Jesus is the, the way for us. And sometimes continued suffering is exactly what God intends to happen. He put Paul and Silas in prison, in the stocks at this point. So how do you respond in the midst of this? What does it begin to look like for you? Well, here's what Paul and Silas did. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That's crazy. <laughs> in the stocks, in the inner prison, and these guys start singing. After being beaten with rods, I mean, I don't know, this is worse than a spanking, all right? This is serious torture or abuse, all right? These guys start singing, all right? And suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prisoner, prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. What? So you get beat up, get locked in the stocks, not comfortable. And what is Paul and Silas' response? Jesus loves me, this I know. Like, oh my goodness. These guys start singing praise songs in the midst of all of this. This is amazing to me. In the midst of their suffering, they choose to experience joy. <laughs> That's hard for me. I don't think I'm there yet. But a mature follower of Christ, someone who is maturing and becoming a, a, a fully devoted disciple of Jesus, chooses joy in the midst of those suffering moments chooses joy. Get that? That's a choice. That's a heart choice. How are you going to respond? They choose this. Man, without Jesus, none of this makes sense. Now, so if you're not a Christ follower, this is where you, you can have something different in your life. The promise is that if you understand Jesus and, and you accept the gift that he has given to you today, that you too can choose joy. Did you know that? If you say, you just say, man, I, I trust God. God says if, uh, that Jesus has come, he has lived a perfect life, that he died, that he rose again from the dead, and that resurrection has restored us. It's allowed us to have a restored relationship with God. That we don't have to live broken lives anymore. That the suffering and all the brokenness that we deal with every day, we don't have to own anymore. If we will trust Jesus, receive the gift of life that he gives us, by faith, say, yes, Jesus, you are the only way that we can, can know you and the only way that we can be restored to God. If we do that, then we, any of us who do that, can choose joy in the midst of suffering because we're choosing Jesus in the midst of that suffering. Make sense? Right? So it's good for us. We have to know that. By faith, we trust. We receive the gift that God has given. Now, as believers, that doesn't doesn't mean that all the suffering goes away. In fact, suffering is inevitable for believers. Great. I'm like, this is a bad sales pitch, and I know that, all right? This is how it works, though. Suffering is, is, is inevitable. We know that following Jesus is not a magical cure for all of our circumstances. Jesus promised that his followers would face all kinds of persecutions of many kinds. It's just going to happen. And so when we follow Christ, when we say, yes, I choose joy, we should expect even more suffering in our life. <laughs> this, is, this is the worst recruitment speech ever. But this is what scripture says, all right? We know that. 
But we also know that in the midst of that suffering, not only is it inevitable, but it's also praiseworthy. That because we can suffer, we know that Jesus is there with us. We can experience joy in the midst of, 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 of our unjust situation or whatever is going on. Paul and Silas, man, they were locked up unjustly. And they choose joy. They choose to praise. It's because they had a realistic expectation of what it meant to follow Jesus. They already knew that this was a good possibility for them. To proclaim the truth of Jesus would oftentimes lead to suffering. And they counted it a joy to be persecuted for the sake of Jesus. We can do that too. You can choose joy as well. You can sing praises in the midst of those tough times. And another thing about suffering, guys, suffering is not the end. I've said this before, but my dad has this card on his desk, and he always, I always remember it, because every time I go over there, it sits there. And it says, um, everything is okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. And that is so scripturally true. Suffering is not the end of the story. The, the pain you feel right now is not where, we, where the story ends. The story ends when Jesus rescues us, when he returns for us, when we live in glory with God forever. That's the end of the story. That's the, the hope that we hold on to as Christ followers. But now, it's going to feel painful at times. It's going to be difficult at times. There are things that are going to happen that you're just going to be, man, this is a not cool, right? But that's okay. It's not the end. Our end is with Jesus, and we're not there yet. Paul and Silas got that. So here's what happens next. So they, they, they talked to the jailer guy, uh, but when it was day, verse 35, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. <laughs> Paul's a smart guy. Okay, just so you know, he's one of those genius guys. He's my hero. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Okay, so they, they come in and say, all right, the earthquake was a little scary for us. Sometimes that's an omen of God, so we'll just kind of, you guys just get out of town, and we'll just call it even, all right? And Paul says, uh, no, that's not how we're going to play this one. You arrested us, you beat us, you threw in, in, us in prison, and oh, by the way, we're Roman citizens, Philippi is a Roman colony under Roman rule. If, if the, the, Paul could have reported them to Caesar, to the, the main king, and the people of Philippi could have lost all of their privileges that they had. I mean, they really, they could have been stripped down to nothing, no, not even a colony status at this point based on what they had just done. So the magistrates were understandably afraid, <laughs> a little bit nervous about what's going on. Oh, snap. You know, do you ever have those moments? You're like, oh, that's not good, you know? Uh, man, this isn't good. So, Paul, and, and why does Paul do Is Paul just kind of rubbing it in their face here? I don't think so. Because the result is the church in Philippi can now operate without worrying about the government getting involved in what they're doing, Right? By, by clearing his name and saying, hey, we're not guilty of doing anything wrong here, the government officials then can say to the church in Philippi, go about your business. <laughs> You're good. You weren't started by those guys that were, that were uh, corrupt, that were trying to overthrow the government. You're not one of those people. And so just, yeah, go. So Paul, by, by claiming his rights as a Roman citizen, is laying the groundwork for this church to operate freely in Philippi. How amazing is that? Paul's a smart guy. He gets it. It wasn't about him, again, claiming his rights. It wasn't about him. What was he doing? It's about Jesus, right? And he's helping this new group of, of, of brand new believers to be able to worship without having to worry about what was going on in, in the city. 
That's amazing to me. Paul's my hero, just so you know. He's one of, and this is one of those guys. He wanted it to be clear that a mistake had been made, and these people, the church that he had been hanging out with, were not, uh, not guilty of anything that, that they had accused him of. So here, Paul was rescued, right? Earthquake, things fall off. He could have run away right then. He stays in prison and waits for the apology. Could have done it in lots of different ways that he could have done this, but he stays there. And the rescue that God seemed to have given him, he didn't take. You notice that? He stayed there. And he stayed there so that something greater could happen. Sometimes the way out is not the way out. You ever see that? You get those, cir- those circumstances, those situations that just feel overwhelming, and there's just a little kind of crack over here. You're like, ah, oh, if I run this way, I'd be out from underneath all of this stuff. And sometimes that way out is not the way out. Sometimes to be a mature follower of Christ, you have to continue to sit in the midst of that circumstance. And the best thing you can do is just stay there. And stay there and continue to proclaim the goodness of Jesus. Rescue for a mature person is not the goal. Paul and Silas' escape from prison. The other stories where, where there's like an earthquake and the prison gets out, like well, Peter a couple weeks ago, Peter getting out of prison, that was the climax of the story. That's not the climax here. The jail's open, they could have walked away. That's not the end of the story here. So the rescue wasn't the goal of, for Paul and Silas here. Paul and Silas take the time, they proclaim to the jailer, they proclaim to the city, they, they help the church to get established here. They rescued the jailer instead of being rescued themselves. They rescued the church instead of accepting rescue for themselves. They stay put in prison because they understand that in all the circumstances, the story was not about them. It's never about us. It's about Jesus. Rescue's not about you. God may and and often does provide us answers and relief from different kinds of circumstances, but we can never see the entire picture of how God is working. It's just not possible for us, all right? We we don't know what all is going on. And sometimes your difficulty, your suffering right now might be for your benefit. Sometimes they might be for someone else's benefit that's watching you. And I think that happens a lot more than we realize. Difficult circumstances in our lives, and we're just like, oh, God, rescue us. But there are people watching us and how we respond to that. And they want to know, hey, if you're a Christ follower, what does that look like in the midst of this difficulty? (laughs) In a minor setting, I have a difficulty. I need a place to live, all right? The, the faith property, I don't know if you know, is, is finally set a closing date, June 22nd, all right? That's great news, all right? Very good, yay, all right? But that means that we have to move now, all right? We need a place to live. There's a lot of pressure on that. That's a, a difficult circumstance. But I know that God provides just in time. There's all kinds of people looking and praying and helping us to find the, the, the right place, and, and I'm concerned and worried because, I mean, I'm a man. That's my job, to worry about these kinds of things. How am I going to provide for my wife and children, all that kind of stuff? I get that. But this story isn't about me. It's about Jesus. I'm firmly convinced that in a couple of weeks, I'll come up here and say, Lou, we have the perfect place. And you guys are going to be like, yay, go Jesus. And we'll say, yes, that's it. Because this is about Jesus, not about me. You get to watch me, yay. I'm not really, I, I'm not totally happy about that, but it happened, right? Yay. Because my circumstances are not really that big a deal in the grand scheme of things. Jesus is so much bigger. Jesus is so much greater. And we can trust him and choose joy no matter what gets thrown at us. Some of us even choose, to, choose difficult circumstances on our own. You ever done that? You just choose a life that is difficult? We have someone in our church that's done that. Mary Sides, on, do you know Mary Sides? She's over here. She's like, don't look at me yet. So. She's chosen difficulty because she's obeying God because she knows the story's about Jesus. It's about God and not about her, right? 
she would say that mostly. And she's actually about to leave for Africa for a couple months. And we would like to actually pray for her today. So hey, will you come on up and then the elders, will you guys come on up too? We're going to pray for her. Well, goodbye. And I'm not trying to make a hero out of Mary, but we really need to recognize this. I mean, this is someone who is, is stepping out of comfort zone, someone who is choosing to be obedient, and that is worth praising and worth praying for. And so we want to pray for you. Uh, will you tell us where exactly you're going, what you're doing? So I am going to this country called Zambia. It's in South, South, Southern Africa. It's about three countries up from South Africa. And I'll be staying there in an orphanage up at the top. And there I will do an internship with the lady that runs the orphanage and kind of learn the ins and outs of how to run an orphanage. And I will be able to just love on the kids and show them somebody that they need to be, you know, like hopefully in the future. And I will be there for about nine months. So just over nine months. So I will be missing everybody here very, very dramatically. <laughs> and um, what else? Why are you doing this? Uh, God put in my heart a long time ago that I, missions it was just something that I fell in love with. I grew up going to um, Mexico every summer, and so Mexico was like my second home. And then we would do missions throughout the year, and then I started doing missions going by myself. So I went to like the Philippines and Albania, and then finally I was able to go to Africa. And there in Africa, I fell in love with just the community. I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the kids. And I fell in love with the lifestyle there. And so I, I just, it's something that God laid on my heart and gave me a peace about. And so I felt the calling from God that this is where he wants me to go and experience this at least for nine months to start out with. So. Awesome. And one last question. What specifically can we be praying for you about over the next nine months? I think the biggest issue is health for me. I have not the strongest immune system. So, and there's tons of germs, there's tons of bacteria, there's tons of everything over there that likes to eat you. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so you can pray for my health, that would be great because I always get sick over there and it's never fun. And so that'd be the biggest thing that you can pray for, that'd be great. Awesome, thanks. What do you guys want to pray for? Or you, I guess, sorry, I forgot you were here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Mike, will you pray for Mary, and we'll just uh, commission her today. Father, we thank you, first of all, for Mary's obedience in following you, following your will for her life, Lord. <clears throat> thank you for her sacrifice. And, Lord, we lift up her immune system, Lord, as she has asked us to pray for. We just, as a, a church body right now, we want to support her in this, that uh, we, we will pray for her as she's over there. Strengthen her body. Lord, give her the nourishment she needs and, and just uh, wash her with your blood, Lord, and, and protect her, Lord, from any germs uh, that would uh, take her down, Lord. Uh, so, Lord, we just pray for her strength, her uh, enthusiasm, Lord, and her... Uh, just ability to love on these children. Lord, we just pray for all those things to come together and that uh, you would just send your angels before her and uh, guide her steps, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks. please be praying for her. Please also continue to seek Jesus. Continue to make him the priority because joy is amazing to experience. And when we follow Christ and we're obedient to what he has in our hearts, we too can experience joy no matter what. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that you give joy. 
that that is a gift that we can just grab if we just trust you. God, help us to seek you above all things. Help us to, to be passionate and, and just continue to mature and grow up and, and to be followers that, that know who you are and know who we are because of you. God, transform our lives. Fill us with that joy and that peace that you promise so that we can continue to proclaim your greatness to the people around us in ways that, is, that, that make sense, that's winsome, and that people understand and uh, that make people want to experience the joy that you offer as well. In your name we pray.